Alright, here's the first page of your Chapter 4A review packet. And the first thing I want to do is to just discuss some of the general rules regarding radicals, uh, multiplying radicals, dividing radicals, and simplifying radicals. And then the uh, second thing I want to talk about is just how radicals in the denominator of any fraction need to be rationalized. We'll talk about how you do that. There's a couple methods that you're going to use to do that. So the first thing is just to remember a few of these basic rules. So the first one is just when you multiply two radicals. So for instance, if I take root 2 times root 3. Okay, you can multiply radicals all day long. Okay, you just have to multiply the numbers underneath and then keep it under the radical. So root 2 times root 3 is root 6. On the other hand, if you did root 2 plus root 3, it doesn't reduce. You can't, you can't combine radicals unless they are like radicals. All right, and just on the same note, if I took, say, like 2 root 2 times 3 root 5, for instance, you can multiply these numbers. You just have to multiply the numbers outside together, 2 times 3 being 6, and then the numbers inside, root 2 times root 5 being root 10. So, some general rules there regarding multiplying and adding radicals. Again, you've got to have like radicals if you want to add them, uh, but you can multiply any radicals that you want together. Um, all radicals need to be simplified. Okay, what that means is if I have, for instance, like root 18, we'll take a simple example. Uh, root 18 has a perfect square factor of 9, so when I break this up, I can't just leave it as root 18. I've got to call it root 9 and root 2. Okay, and then when I, when I break it down again, square root of 9 is 3. Square root of 2 is just the square root of 2, so then that would be the answer to that. So if you multiply radicals and you end up with a radical that needs to be reduced, you have to, you have to reduce. All right, and then the last general property uh, that I wanted to talk about is dividing. Uh, and you can divide radicals. If radicals have the same, have, have are, one radical is a factor of another, and you're dividing the two, that they can be divided. So if I have, say, for instance, like root 10 divided by root 2, okay? Or you may see it like this, root 10 over root 2. You can divide these radicals. Just like we said, we can multiply radicals. We can divide them in the same sense. So this could be called root 5 in either, in either circumstance. Uh, so just look out for that. If they're not divisible, say I had root 10 divided by root 3, for instance, then we have to do something different. That, that leads me to the next thing, which is radicals in the denominator. Radicals in the denominator need to be rationalized, so there's two ways this can look. So for instance, if I had, let's just take that root 10 over root 3 example. Since 10 to can't be divided by 3, I have to get that radical out of the denominator in a different way, and that is by multiplying top and bottom by the radical. So in this case, you get 10, root, 10 times root 3 is root 30. And then any radical times itself is going to be the number. So root 3 times root 3 is root 9, which actually is the square root of 9 is 3. All right. The other way you can see it is, let's just keep with the root 10, but say I had like 1 plus root 3 on the bottom. Okay, you still have a root on the bottom, but you also have a number. You can't just multiply top and bottom by root 3. That would not get rid of the radical on the bottom. In this case, we have to multiply with what we call the conjugate. Okay, the conjugate is exactly what it looks like, except the number in the middle is opposite, or the, the sign in the middle is opposite. So you multiply top and bottom by 1 minus root 3. And actually that will take care of the radical in the bottom. We're going to look at a couple examples of that in a second. So that leads us into the problems here. So if we could look at this worksheet here, we're going to look at a couple examples. Um, take for instance number 3. Okay, number 3 is an example of what I was talking about as far as multiplying radicals. In this case, you see, negative 2 times 7 is negative 14. Root 6 times root 3 is root 18. And here's what I was talking about. If you, if you end up with a radical that it needs to be reduced, you've got to continue to work until that radical is in its most reduced form. So it's root 9 and root 2. And kind of lucky that we just did that one. So I take root 9 is 3. So I'm going to take this. It's going to be... 3 root 2, and then negative 14 times 3 is negative 42 root 2. So that would be the perfect simplified answer to that particular question. Uh, moving along, if I look at number 4, for instance, uh, just because there's a radical there shouldn't throw you off. These are just like multiplying fractions. And when you have the same thing on the top and the bottom of a fraction, that cancels. And when I multiply two radicals, just multiply them together. Like we said, we can multiply any radicals we want. So root 12 over root 16 reduces. You can take a 4 out of each of these. 4 out of 12 
is 3, 4, 16 divided by 4 is 4. So then I get root 3 over root 4. And root 4 is just 2. So this actually just breaks down into root 3 over 2. So just, you know, be confident with your, with your rules. There's nothing too crazy in this page that's going to mess you up significantly. Um, and you could look at the next ones and apply those same rules. All right. So looking at the next bunch, multiplying by the conjugate, I'm going to be looking at a couple of these just to get you a little bit more familiar with it. But um, essentially, all you got to do is what we said, and that is to multiply top and bottom by root 3 plus 5. Okay, in this case, you can't just multiply top by root 3 plus 5. You got to, I'm sorry, bottom by root 3 plus 5. You got to multiply top and bottom. Because I don't want to change the value of it. You just multiply top and bottom by the same thing. It's essentially the same as multiplying by 1. So 2 times root 3 on the top will give me 2 root 3. 2 times 5 will give me 10. On the bottom, you FOIL. Okay, What's going to happen when you multiply anything by the conjugate? When you FOIL any conjugate, you're going to get the inner and outer terms to cancel out. So I'll show you what that looks like. But root 3 times root 3 is just 3. And then I do outer and inner, which is going to give me 5 root 3 minus 5 root 3. So you can almost get good. When you get good at this, you're not even going to have to write the outer and inner because you know those are just going to cancel. And the, that's the point, is to get rid of the radical. And then the last, negative 5 times 5 is negative 25. And at this point, I just continue to reduce. I get 2 root 3 plus 10 over negative 22. And at this point, because these three terms all have a common factor of 2, and you got to make sure all three do. Okay, don't just cancel. If these two have a common factor of and this one does not, you can't cancel anything. So make sure all three have a common factor. In this case, that common factor is 2, and I could take a 2 out of everything. So 2 out of 2 root 3 is root 3, 2 out of 10 is 5, and then 2 out of a negative 22 is negative 11. So there's my final answer. Okay, we'll look at one more, uh, just to kind of see what, what happens if you have two numbers on the top. So for instance, number 12, you want to multiply by the conjugate once again. In this case, the conjugate of the bottom is 5 minus root 5. And then I don't care what the top looks like. I'm just going to multiply top and bottom by the same thing. And now at this point, you FOIL top and bottom. But what's going to happen is you know that the top and the, the top is not the conjugate of 5, 5 minus root 5. So therefore, you're going to have inner and outer terms that you're going to have to worry about. So for the top, I get first outer 1 times negative root 5 is negative root 5. Inner root 5 times 5 is 5, five root 5. And then last, root 5 times negative root 5 is negative 5. So what you see here is that the 5 minus 5 cancels. Um, I'm just going to work it out on the bottom before I continue. On the bottom, I multiply by the conjugate. So that would just be 25. And like I said, I know inner and outer are going to cancel. So I could just take the last, which is root 5 times negative root 5, which we already multiplied, to be negative 5. All right, at this point, I get negative root 5 on top plus 5 root 5 is going to be positive 4 root 5. On the bottom, I get 20. And at this point, you check your fa common factors. Does 4 and 20 have a common factor? And the answer is, yeah, you could take a 4 out. 4 out of 4 root 5 is just 1 root 5. 4 out of 20 is 5. So that one breaks all the way down to root 5 over 5. So, you know, watch the steps again. This is, I wouldn't say this is a simple uh, concept, but it is one that I think if you practice enough, it should, it should become a little bit easier as you go. All right, looking at page two of your chapter 4A review, there's a few questions here that you kind of want to, um, we should go over and see how they, how they kind of play out. So looking at 19th, or number 13 through 18, you have some rules dealing with I. And just in general, there's some, some general I rules that you might need a little bit of recap on. Okay, I is the square root of negative 1. So because of that, i squared is going to equal the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, which is simply negative 1. i to the third is going to equal the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. So that's just going to give you negative square root of negative 1 or negative i. And then i to the fourth is essentially i squared squared, so it's negative 1 times itself, so essentially it's just going to give you 1. So if you ever multiply i times itself, you get rid of the radical, and that's the point I'm going to try to make here when we look at these questions here. So when you multiply an i times an i, the radical goes away. You have no more i. Uh, and that's going to be especially important in like question 16 
an 18 where I have I's on the bottom. Since I's are like radicals, I can't have them on the bottom either. So I'm going to look at numbers, uh, let's say, number 14, and then we'll look at number 16 just to give you an idea of what we're talking, to, talking about as far as getting numbers off the bottom. So number 14, number 14 is like an I foil question. So <clears throat> when you see that, it's simply just two binomials. You just foil, first, outer, inner, last taking into mind that when you multiply i times itself, you get i squared, which is actually negative 1. So we're going we're gonna to take that into account. So first is 2 times 1 is 2. Outer, 2 times 2i is positive 4i. Inner, negative 7i times 1 is negative 7i. And then last, negative 7i times positive 2i is negative 14i squared. Okay, so when I multiply i times itself, I get i squared. So at this point, I got 2 4i and 7i are negative. 4i minus 7i should give you negative 3i when you combine those. And then now you got to take into account the fact that i squared is negative 1. So I'm going to completely change i squared to be negative 1. So you see what I did there? I just took i squared, which we know is just simply negative 1. I just replaced it. So continuing on, I get um, 2 minus 3i plus 14. So all together, combine 2 and 14, you get 16 minus 3i. And that's my final answer to number 14 right there. And it's just a FOIL question where you have to take into account the fact that when you multiply i times itself or i, I squared, you get negative 1. All right, let's look at 16. 16 is a little more interesting in the sense that I get, I have an i on the bottom of a fraction. And it's not just i by itself, it's an i with a number. So here's a question where you have to multiply by what we called the conjugate, like we did on page 2, or page 1 when we multiplied the radicals. But this one's a little bit different because i is involved. So it's still the same idea in the sense where you multiply the conjugate 2 plus i. The conjugate of a binomial is simply the same thing, but you change the, the middle sign. So in the top you get 8 times 2 is 16. 8 times i is 8i. On the bottom you foil it up. Okay, so 2 times 2 is 4. And like we said before, when you multiply by the conjugate, the inner and outer terms of FOIL cancel out. So I'm going to get, I could write it out, but it's going to give me plus 2i minus 2i. So outer is two, positive 2i, inner is negative 2i, and then last is going to be negative i times i, or negative i squared. Okay, bringing this down, I, st I still got 16 plus 8i on the top. On the bottom, I got 4, the i's, 2i's cancel, and I got minus i squared, so it's a minus a negative 1 here. So continuing on, I get 16 plus 8i all over 5. And I can't reduce that. None of, the, none of the three terms have a common factor, so that's as good as I can do. So you see it's the same concept. You can't have i on the bottom. Um, just looking, at, looking ahead, if I look at number 18, here you see just the 3i on the bottom. Well, that's actually easier than the last one. Okay, you, All you have to do for that one is, if you, like, like I said, if you have a singular i on the bottom, just multiply top and bottom by i. Okay, you'll get i squared on the bottom, it'll get rid of that, that i. So that's a quick tip for that one. All right, the last thing I want to talk, from, talk about from this page is number 19. Number 19 is a graphing square, a square root problem. Okay, uh, typically what, what I teach with graphing square roots is, is where does the graph start? And very similar to graphing absolute value or really graphing anything, um, you can see by the way that this is by the way that this goes, you have a horizontal shift two to the right. Okay, so when I see this, I'll zoom in real quick. But I got a minus two inside. Okay, so that indicates a horizontal shift of two to the right. Okay, you always go opposite of what's inside, and then you see is four outside which indicates a vertical shift up four, okay? So with these particular questions, I kind of, I kind of steer away from using the table as much uh, because I, I kind of know where this graph starts. Okay, normal graphs of square root of x start at zero, zero. Well, this one, since it's shifting right two and up four, it's going to start at two, four. So you can kind of get the idea of the starting point. Starting, starting point will be two, four. So looking at that, from there, it just behaves, this, behaves the same as anything that you do with transformations. So I shift right two, I shift up four, and then I look, is there a number in front that's going to change like the, 
I was going to stretch it or shrink it since there isn't. It's just this typical square root graph. And it's all about knowing your parent functions as far as I'm concerned, as far as graphing is concerned. Um, we could talk about how to use your calculator in a second, but for this particular case, I'm going to start at 2, 4. I'm just going to graph this thing, and we're going to talk about domain and range of it. But start at 2, 4, and then it's a typical square root graph. So up over 2, up 4, okay? And your typical square root graph, 1 squared is 1, all right? 4 squared, square, sorry, square root square root of 1 is 1, square root of 4 is 2, so my graph should look something like that. Okay, so now I think domain and range. Well, domain is all the x values, and all the x values of this graph start at x equals 2, because that was your starting point, like we said. So this point here, 2, 4, so I think about x axis, so what I, what I typically like to do is I like to say, okay, well, x values start here, and they go here. So if I were to, to talk about, like, well, what does this equation look like? Well, that would just be x is greater than or equal to 2. Well, actually, that's going to be my domain. So if I look at this, the domain is the same thing. x is greater than or equal to 2. Okay? And on the y-axis, you do the same thing. So I'm looking at the y-axis here. And I say, well, the y value start at 4. And then the graph goes up from there. So again, if I was to turn this sideways and look at this being like an equation dealing with y, well, this would be y is greater than or equal to 4. Well, that, in fact, is my range. So you would write y is greater than or equal to 4. So it's all about where the y values start, where the x values start, and then what direction they go in. So if, if they went left or down, you know, You'd have a you'd have a less you know instead of the x being greater than two, or equal to two, it would be like x is less than or equal to two. So that's the typical way that I like to graph. Um, you may fill in the table as well. Um, my suggestion there is just simply type the equation into your calculator, and then look at the table, and then fill the table in and plot your points from there. You're gonna find a point on your table where it's just gonna be error 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 because there's certain values that are restricted. So if you see anything less than two. You know that there's no there, uh, for x for x is less than two. There's no there's no values there, so there's going to be um, errors in your table. So that's going to be my tip for that. So as far as that one's concerned, kind of, you know, I think about the shifts. I think about the transformations, graph it, and then the domain and range from there. Okay, so hopefully this helps you with page two of your chap chapter four A packet. All right, page three has basically one type of question. That are, those are questions dealing with radicals and trying to get rid of a radical. So to get rid of radicals, if you've got radicals on both sides, radicals on one side, simply just square both sides, okay? The trick here is when you square a side that has a binomial, you have to take into account that you have to square it and foil. So I'm going to look at question 25, for, in, for instance, because 26 is very similar. So I'm looking at a square root. I want to get rid of the square root. So what you have to make sure of is when you square both sides that you foil the left side, okay? So I see x plus 5 squared. x plus 5 squared is not just x squared plus 25. That's the most common error. x plus 5 squared is like saying x plus 5 times itself, okay? So we got to remember when I multiply a binomial times itself, that's a foil question. The square root of x squared minus 7 does not have to be distributed because basically the square root was over the whole thing. So squaring a square root cancels it out. So I'm really just working on the left side trying to figure out what this answer is. I'm going to leave the right side alone for a bit. So it's just first, outer, inner, last. So first, outer, inner are 5x and 5x. And then the last is 25. All right. So now you combine like terms. You get x squared plus 10x plus 25 equals x squared minus 7. The x's are going to cancel if you subtracted x from both sides, x squared from both sides. You see that they go away, so which is kind of nice because I didn't really want to do an MAF question here. So at this point, I can subtract 25, and I'm left with 10x on the left side, and then negative 7 minus 25 is negative 32, and then it's going to be x equals negative 3.2. Well, let me see. Redo that. So x is negative 3.2. All right, so the number is not super pretty, but 
No, nah, that's your answer. And you could check it, plug it back in, see if the answers match up, and they should for this particular question.